Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, spending time out of your busy day uh, to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Ronald Cruz. I am a facilitator for IF Day. I currently work for Hillsborough County School District as a coordinator of refugee services. And again, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this webinar and hope you like it. Um, we're going to set some ground rules as we go along in this particular webinar. Uh, first thing that I'd like for you to know is that um, in this webinar, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, and those questions will be stored into our uh, database. And as we go along, if time permits, I may uh, respond to some questions. Or towards the end of our webinar, I will be uh, going going over some of those questions and answering them for you. Um, and as we go along with this particular webinar, you can also uh, tweet uh, your experience uh, during the webinar using the hashtag MathDefrag. It's in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, you cannot click that, but that's just to show you what you're supposed to, um, to put in a, as a hashtag so that Everything compiles into our math diffrag um, comments. You can also um, you can also again participate in the conversation by raising your hand and typing in your question in in the dashboard on your screen. Again, my name is Ronald Cruz. Um, I just to show you a brief um, my brief credentials. Uh, I am a coordinator of refugee services in Hillsborough County. I've uh, been a peer evaluator and been a mathematics teacher all my life. And um, I've been uh, in various supervisory positions. Um, and I'm also involved in robotics during my free time. So I was um, picked as a robotic coach for one of my schools. Uh, I also work a lot in grants, and that's how I got involved with the refugee program. Uh, if you would like to connect with me, you can you can see me at my LinkedIn page, and you just look for one Ron Cruz, or you can email me at ronald.cruz at live.com. Um, at this time, I'm going to uh, turn off the webcam uh, so that uh, you can all focus on your screen. I'm going to go over the objectives of this training. One of the things that we're going to be learning in this webinar is uh, getting a little bit more familiar with the 2014 series GED test, knowing the format, the content, what are the skills that students need to know. Um, I'm also going to talk about a little bit on uh, the web's depth of knowledge, which can be emphasized in classroom instruction. Uh, and implementing the content standards of the 2014 GED test. I will also talk about the mathematical practices as we go along, uh, something that, again, GED is stressing out in terms of how we instruct our students. We will talk about a little bit on the calculator skills, um, and we're going to address some of the weakest areas of the GED testing service based on the recent analytics conducted by GED testing service and uh, Florida Department of Education. Uh, we'll solve some similar problems to the 2014 release sample items and you will gain a lot of uh, strategies from just by listening and participating in this webinar. To start, um, I wanted to draw your attention to some statistics that were shared during the recently uh, concluded 
ACE conference, um, one of the things that they shared that so far uh, over the span of nine months, um, there were a total of 9,849 uh, testers that have completed all four modules of the test. And out of the 9,849, 5,233 passed uh, all four modules of the test, giving us a passing rate of 53%. And this is as of September 26, 2014. I also wanted to show you a visual representation of how completers and passers are fluctuating throughout the first nine months of the release of the 2014 GED test. In January, you would notice that there is a very, uh, it's very low because we're just starting to roll out. A lot of students are hesitant to take the test. We didn't have in as many passers and completers. Uh, and if, as you know as well, there, is, there has been a significant gap over the period of nine months between the number of completers and passers. And uh, this next slide just shows you um, the pass rate um, and how it fluctuates throughout the year or over the span of nine months. You would notice in this graph that uh, it peaks in June and it also peaks in August. And one of the things that, uh, that the GED testing service uh, told us is that, you know, this is expected because uh, it, around the month of June, students are just, uh, especially the ones that are in high school that didn't pass uh, or didn't get a diploma during high school, that's when they're starting to sign up immediately for the test. That's why there's a spike in June. And then August is also the start of the school year. So a lot of students are signing up for testing to get into the programs that start in August. That's why that explains the spike in those two months. I also wanted to show you the performance distribution over all of the four modules of the 2014 GED test. You would notice that mathematics has the highest uh, below passing rate and has the lowest passing rate. I'm experiencing a little bit of a technical difficulty uh, regarding my slides. It's not advancing, so I do apologize. All right. Um, this next slide shows you the distribution of scores in the mathematics tests. And as you will notice in this slide, that most of our students that are testing, uh, that have tested, fall under just right below, Z, I mean, one to 10 points below the passing, the passing score. So, so what does this imply? This implies that there's not a lot of our students really are almost prepared, almost prepared to take and pass the uh, the GED test. It just requires a little bit more uh, changes in the way we teach them, a little bit more reminders from here and there. And we're going to get into those um, topics as we move along with our webinar. Most importantly, as we go through this uh, webinar, one of the things I'd like to stress out that knowing the format of the test, knowing the content, and knowing the skills that are being tested is really the first step for you to ensure that your students are successful. Uh, one of the things that is available all, 
on YouTube and through the 2014 G Shifting Service is the Exploring the Mathematical Reasoning module. It's a it's about 40 minutes of a recorded webinar that you can view, talking about giving you some important uh, important key ideas that you need to know as a teacher, uh, changes between the old and the new series of GED, and uh, some tips and uh, tricks for teachers as they uh, start the school year or move along with the school year. Available to teachers are a plethora of resources, and uh, I'm highlighting some of them that have been very useful just to me as well. Uh, uh, one of the things that is a lot of that I use the most is the assessment guide for educators. Uh, it contains a lot of things. Uh, it explains in detail the standards that are being tested. Uh, it also contains um, the mathematical practices that we need to be applying in our classes. Um, it also talks about the web's depth of knowledge uh, and all the other things that is important for educators to know. Um, a test comparison is also available at the GED testing service that you can download and read through. Uh, especially if you are a veteran teacher, you might want it to uh, make note of certain changes between the old 20, 2002 series test and the 2014 uh, series tests because you might, you know, those things will help you tweak your instruction as to which one should I focus more as, as I move along and prepare my students for the GED test. Um, if you view the, web, the webinar on uh, the Exploring the Mathematics module, it, they will talk about uh, what is new on the reasoning test and I just wanted to emphasize those things as uh, as we go along. Um, one of the things that is new is the absolute value, not so much as the concept of absolute value, but rather the absolute value of a rational number. So uh, students may be given a decimal, an integer, um, a percent, or a fraction, and they will be expected to be to know how to find the absolute value of that. Um, Another is the concept of undefined um, is already introduced. You will see that as well as part of the AE symbols that students can pick from, which indicates that it is a possible answer, that undefined is an acceptable answer. Um, factoring polynomials, I just wanted to um, explain that a little bit more. On the factoring of polynomial expressions, um, it is limited to uh, second degree quadratic. So uh, don't get scared when you when you see the factoring polynomial expressions. You're not going to get the fourth degree or fifth degree polynomials and so on and so forth. And you will also uh, you will see a lot of um, perfect square quadratics there uh, that are easily factorable. Um, the emphasis of the GED test is not really on the factoring scale, but knowing the concept of a factor. And uh, it helps you when you're solving a uh, real world situation that can be uh, expressed as a uh, second degree quadratic. Um, one of the things that is new as well is solving inequalities. And what you're, you're going to see is that the fourth all the way through the sixth bullet, oh, actually seven, is all talking about linear inequalities. So what that means is that we need to put a lot of more focus on not just writing an inequality or evaluating an inequality, but also uh, expressing the solution to an inequality using a uh, line, line graph. Uh, and then lastly is identifying a function in a table or a graph. It used to be just evaluating a function based on a value of x or y. Uh, now, students are expected to be able to determine the function itself if they're just given a graph or a table of value. Knowing what is on is what is not 
on the 2014 GED test is also important. Uh, there's not going to be a single question just asking for students to select an appropriate operation in order to solve the problem. Uh, what that means is that they're not going to ask the students or they're not going to ask in the test for the students to solve the problem, I mean to, to find the operation, but rather to already solve the problem using the appropriate operation. Uh, there's not going to be any questions on basic arithmetic. Um, also, estimation has been uh, has been eliminated. Uh, students are expected to use their estimation skills, though, to evaluate the reasonableness of their answer. But that's not going to be the final answer to the questions that are on the 2014 GED test. Um, a lot of the things that are also included here are Selecting the appropriate units of measure is not going to be the main question to ask, although students are going to be expected to type in the correct unit given a, you know, to solve a specific problem. Um, there's not going to be any questions talking about scales and meters and gauges, but students are already expected to know how to interpret a scale in order to get to an answer or in order to get to an information that is critical to solving the real-world problem. So that's just um, uh, a little bit of an um, insight on what is not on the mathematical reasoning test. It's not that they're completely removed from the test, it's just that they become now necessary sub-steps for students to arrive at the final answer. Mathematical practices. Um, mathematical practices is highly emphasized throughout the different uh, assessment guides and even in the exploring the module. Uh, the GED testing service, Pearson, uh, Pearson Views, is, uh, emphasizes this a lot that uh, if we apply one or two or a combination of these mathematical practices as we teach the lessons to the students, um, it would be advisable to do that. Um, one of the things that is highly emphasized in these mathematical practices is the building a solution pathway and lines of reasoning. Uh, students are expected to, given a specific situation, to know certain entry points for the problem to be solved. So whether evaluating uh, what are the necessary uh, givens in the problem, uh, filtering out what is unnecessary, uh, and recognizing um, a sub-step in order to arrive to a given, uh, a given number in the problem. We will talk about the mathematical practices uh, throughout this webinar, so, uh, and, uh, and we will be applying them as we go along to some of the activities that I incorporated in this webinar. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the web step of knowledge. Um, one of the things that we need to be cognizant is to know what level of web step of knowledge are we teaching students to. Um, so a higher emphasis on levels two, three, and four skill concepts, strategic thinking and extended thinking respectively, is expected as if you want our students to be successful in the GED test. Sample activities are in here, not only specifically uh, pertaining to mathematics, but it's in all subject areas. The key words that are listed on each of the quadrants, but even though it's not a square, but in around the circle, uh, let's say just in level one, gives you the examples of keywords or prompts that you may ask your students. So uh, as we go along introducing the lesson, we will probably use a lot of level one prompts 
But as we move along and we build, uh, build upon student skills, we need to be working on the level two and using the level two questioning prompts, and then level three, and then level four. And not only in the questioning, but also in the types of activities that you want your students to do. Like one, for example, in here, I don't know if you can read it from your screen, is critique. Uh, critiquing a, uh, a solution of, of, of another student is a very good practice because it allows uh, the students to put a little bit more attention to detail. Uh, and then uh, it reinforces certain mathematics concepts, whether the students know. So students are not going to be able to critique a, their classmates' work or solution if they don't have the level two and the level one skills. If they don't recognize the operations, they're not going to be able to do a critique. Um, if they don't understand how the graph was generated, if they don't have the necessary estimation skills or relating one operation to the other, it will be very difficult for them to do a critique. So the levels of Bloom, I mean the levels of web uh, depth of knowledge built up, build upon each other and it's a necessary for you to go through these levels and then dwell upon levels two through levels four, which mo where most of the GED questions would fall under. Very recently, um, the GED testing service uh, released some analy analytics to the general public talking about the most missed questions on the test, and they fall on five different categories. Uh, the first category is this block right here. This block right here uh, describes skills that are focusing on more on, more on geometry, uh, circumference and area of circles, finding the radius and the diameter, which will involve some algebraic manipulation, uh, computing the perimeter and area of polygons, so this may be this may include a pentagon uh, finding the side lengths of any polygon given a perimeter and area. So again, a lot of mathematical mathematical manipulations or algebraic man manipulations in order to arrive at the answer, and then perimeter and area of two dimensional composite shapes, which could include circles as well. The second block is. Uh, a lot to do with ratios and proportions and percents. Um, the second block of content is focusing a lot on scale factors and converting between and converting between and using the scale factor to convert between the actual drawing and the dimensions of the scale drawing. If you participate in our six-hour training, which I highly highly encourage. We're going to do a lot of activities that is focusing on the use of scale factors because it's proven to be one, uh, one concept that is very difficult for students to grasp even though they already master the, the, the scale of solving a proportion because uh, it confuses them between conversion uh, between measures of unit and conversion using scale factor. Another thing that I want to talk about under the same block is the real world applications of percent. Uh, it shows here, based on the analytics conducted by GED Testing Service, that students are still having some difficulty in these word problems. So uh, we will talk about that as we go along. No, I'm trying to advance my slides, so I'm just waiting for the slide to move. There you go. The, the next three blocks focuses more on
I went to the Zoom. Uh, I apologize. I had to. All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, I want to talk about um, the next three blocks of contents on the most missed items on the test. A lot on the coordinate geometry and using the slope of a line. And then graphing two variable linear equations. Uh, this is expected because from the previous um, from the previous series uh, of the GD test, uh, students are not expected to graph at all, and so it wasn't built in into our instruction. A lot of the practices on graphing, and now that they are being asked with the advent of technology and the use of uh, the computers to test students, now we are able to test them on graphing skills. So it is, it's expected that we need to start working uh, and uh, helping our students in, in, in order to make them successful in graphing equations using on paper and using the computer. Uh, another thing is the next block of content that is mostly missed is uh, converting between expressions to symbols, translating um, situations into symbolic or to numbers and expressions. Uh, another one under the same block is writing single or two variable equations based on a given situation, and then creating a linear inequality based on a specific uh, Situation. So now we need to give our students a lot of practice in converting between words and then and two symbols. Lastly, is the last skill this description is a lot of on the solving, solving single value variable linear equations and uh, using formulas. So again, we go back to um, algebraic manipulation as a, as a as an area of difficulty for most of our students. Uh, solving linear inequalities. We haven't had uh, that in the old GED tests. So the students are kind of expected to, um, to kind of uh, not score well in these questions because there's not a lot of practice built in. If you attend our 6-hour math GED training, um, these are just some of the things that you're going to be um, doing and you're expected to uh, take out of. So I, again, I highly suggest that you go into our uh, sign up for one of our math, six hour math GED training all around the state. I think the next one uh, is coming up uh, in two days. Uh, we will be in uh, Perry, Perry, Florida, close to Tallahassee. Um, if you are in the county that is, if you are in the surrounding county, I really do suggest that you sign up for those training and take advantage of it. Um, we're going to dig deep into these standards and design some activities that would help your students um, battle the anxiety uh, between the changes from the old and the new GED standards. So we're going to go in and just talk about a, a similar problem uh, that students may encounter in, a, in the GED test. Um, so I'm going to give you some time to read the problem to yourself as I read it to you. And then I'm going to give you some time to you know, work it out on a piece of paper. And then we're going to do a little bit of a poll. So we're going to give you a, an opportunity to uh, respond uh, to this question. And, um, and then we're going to see our results and see what we do. This is a problem that, is, um, that combines multiple concepts and multiple skills. Uh, and uh, let's try this out. And then after that, after we solve this problem, let's, we're, we're going to talk about how we're going to teach this to our students. So I'm going to read the problem to you. A, par a farmer has three silos. The largest silo has a diameter of 24 feet. The radius of the smallest silo is one-third as big as the diameter of the largest. 
the middle sized silo has a radius of two feet greater than the radius of the smallest silo. What is the circumference of each silo? In this particular problem, this is not a simple multiple choice because they're asking for three things here. They want the circumference of each of the silos. So what you see on your screen is are some choices. And um, I'm going to give you some time to uh, work it out on paper, write down all the givens. And then after that, I'm going to poll you so that you can pick your answers, pick the three uh, the three, the circumferences of each silo. I'm going to try to get out of the presentation mode. And so you and then I'm going to try to focus the problem a little bit more so you can still see the question. And in about 30 seconds I'm going to launch a poll for you to participate in. And in the poll, I'd like for you to pick the three circumference, the circumference of each silo. All right, I hope you're ready. If not, just spend the last few seconds making sure that you have all the givens because we're going to be working it out on paper. All right, I'm going to launch now the poll. All right, and I'd like for you to pick and then I'm going to share share the answers so you see how many people pick what. Right, we're still polling. I'm going to give um, some time for everybody to select. Right, I think, um, I think it's uh, stabilized now. Ooh, I'm still getting some more. Okay, let me wait a little bit. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Okay, so if you haven't had a chance to vote yet, that's okay. Uh, I just wanted to see and get a, a feel of how many of you picked the correct answer. All right, so I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to share. All right, I'm going to share you the responses. All right. So you see on your screen, 4% of everyone that voted uh, picked. 14 pied, 75% uh, picked 16 pied, 18% uh, 18 picked 18 pied, 61% picked 20 pied, and 71% picked 24 pied. I'm going to share with you the correct answer. All right, the, the, uh, the circumference of the 
smallest silo is 16 pi. So the majority of us pick that, 75%. The circumference of the middle size silo is 20 pi. And the circumference of the largest silo is 24 pi. So great, we did a great job. Um, all right, so now let's dig deeper into this problem and let's see how we're going to solve this or how, what type of things do we expect our students to be able to do. So I've launched my um, And what I'm going to do is we're going to work this problem. I'm going to work this problem out uh, as I as I talk out loud as I solve. What are the best ways to, for that I talk to the students, especially when talking about this type of problem? is to um, to draw the problem so that they have a visual cue or a visual reminder of what they are solving for. So um, students, and I, you know, I train this, I train my students a lot to, if they have time, quickly sketch out the problem so that it helps them visualize what they're solving for. So. We may be drawing three silos. Medium size and then a small size silo. I apologize for my the imperfection in my drawing. <laughs> All right. And then uh, after drawing it, let's identify what is given. So I'm going to use a different colored pen just to emphasize the largest silo has a diameter of 24 feet so I'm gonna mark that like this 24 feet uh, the radius of the smallest silo, silo is one-third as big as the diameter of the largest so it's talking about the radius on the smallest silo. So I'm going to draw a radius there. And then I'm going to mark it R. And then I'm going to, right now I'm just going to represent it so far as how it said. It's one third as big as the diameter of the largest. So one third as big as the diameter, and that's the diameter of the largest silo is 24 feet. All right, so all I'm doing is transforming the words into symbols and putting them in my drawing so I can clearly see them. The radius of the middle-sized silo is two feet greater than the radius of the smallest silo. So I'm going to put an R right here. And then it's two feet greater than the smallest silo. Now I'm running into some issues because now if I use R right here, I'm going to get confused. My students are going to get confused what I'm talking about. So now I'm going to start to introduce, which students will also encounter in the GED test, the subscripts. Um, what I would do with my students is, since we're talking about the radius of the same thing, I mean of different objects, I'm going to put RS for the radius of the small silo and then RM as the radius of the middle silo or the medium sized silo. So then when I write the middle equation, I'm just going to write it as RM, I mean RS, I'm sorry. And then I'm going to be ready to solve the equations. 
So now I want the radius of the smallest silo. That is just one third times 24. That could be easily uh, simplified or written as a fraction 24 over 3. And that will give you R sub S would be 8. Now we're going to do the same thing here. Now that we have this 8, then we can replace the 8 right here. So this RM is actually 2 plus 8, which is 10. And in this one, since we are all talking about radius here throughout this thing, it would also, some students, you will see them do this. R of L, which is the largest, would be half of the diameter right here, which is 12. So now that we have that, we can continue working on the problem by knowing the circumference formula. We do have two ways to find the the circumference, and that's 2 times pi times the radius, or pi times the diameter, or however in whatever iteration or arrangement. Um, it's good to know both, because in this particular problem, if the student knows both, the student could automatically be find the circumference of the largest silo by simply multiplying pi and um, the diameter of 24, which gives you 24 pi. And then we will be using the second formula, I mean the first formula, 2 pi times the radius, to figure out the circumference of the other two silos. So then now that I have the radius of here, the circumference of the middle silo is 2 times pi times 10, or 2 times 10 times pi, however you want your students to do it. Uh, we're just applying commutative property of multiplication here. That would be 20 pi. And then lastly, we figure out the radius, I mean the circumference of the smallest silo, which is 2 times pi times 8, or 2 times 8 times pi, which is 16 pi. And then, and as you may notice, All of our answers are written in exact form, 24 pi, 20 pi, 16 pi, which students will encounter the most. Rarely would students have to round their answer to a specific decimal point. A lot of the questions in the GED test are expecting exact answers, meaning students do not have to change this to three point uh, or, or the estimated pi value to replace that. Most of the times, uh, most of the time, they will students will just be expected it to uh, expected to write their answer in this format or pick an answer in this particular format. All right, so that's that problem for you. Again, if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to just type it up in the dashboard on your screen, and then I'll be happy to answer them as, as we have time towards the end, or if we have time in, in the middle. Just by doing that particular problem, we we implemented mathematical practices as we go along. We search and recognize an entry point for solving the problem. 
in that particular case, we drew the silos and wrote down the, the formula for finding the circumference of each silo. Our solution pathway was very clear uh, because what we did was to label the radius of the other two silos using what was given in the problem and wrote them in the form of an algebraic expression. And then uh, evaluating the best solution pathway given the criteria, not so much in this portion. Uh, moving along, we also implemented abstracting problems, meaning representing real world problems visually and algebraically, which we clearly did as we solved through the problem. Recognize the important and salient attributes of the problem. Um, one of the things that students will have to recognize is that on the largest silo, they were given a diameter. And so they can use that information right away. They can convert that. I mean, they can find the radius of the largest to be able to apply the, uh, a different formula or uh, just use the diameter as, as it is and just multiply it by pi. So those are really important salient attributes that students will need to know, whereas on the other two silos, we're only given the radius. Um, and then the rest was just mathematical fluency when we, um, when we used the commutative property to interchange numbers around and figure out uh, the value of the circumference. Um, we really didn't have to solve for any for any value here because it's already written as radius or circumference equals something. Um, we did not display our data graphically, and it's not necessary for that particular problem. Now, one great news is that now students may now use the handheld uh, calculator during the test. Um, the testing, the G, your individual GED testing centers may be still working through the logistics of this particular uh, announcement. But uh, as I hear from, as I go from county to county, I'm hearing that a lot of the GED testing centers are have their own set of calculators. Uh, to use in the uh, in what, when they take the mathematics test, um, the GED uh, testing centers wanted to make sure that uh, nothing is stored in the calculator, so the memory is cleared, uh, making sure that uh, nothing is written, or making sure it's written on the cover because on the cover of the calculator there is paper where students can write stuff in it and. Um, and the GED testing service didn't like that. So um, the, what some of the GED testing centers are doing is just they're asking the students to take off the front of the calculator, the front cover of the calculator, and clearing the memory. Um, Okay, and then this is just re-emphasizing what I just um, talked about regarding the calculator. I also wanted to emphasize that there has been some changes, if you haven't known, if you don't know it yet, that the non-calculator portion of the G test was increased to seven questions. So it used to be uh, five questions. And now it's seven questions. And I just wanted to draw your attention to one specific. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what to confuse you. Draw your attention to one specific problem. How do you know what type, what um, questions? Maybe included in the non-calculator um, portion of the test. If you notice, I pulled up the um, the mathematics reasoning uh, mathematics reasoning test sampler, and I'm going to scroll through 
on the and I'd like for you to observe the screen at the top the upper left corner where you see that calculator button and notice when it disappeared. Let me let me go back a little bit so you can see. I know I'm probably scrolling too scrolling too fast. But right here you the, the calculator button disappeared and was replaced by an AE symbol. This should be a good hint for teachers and students that this is uh, a problem that might show up on the non-calculator portion of the GED test because it was raised in one of the trainings that we did. All right, going back to my presentation. Uh, again, you can also request for um, poster size copies of the calculator reference and the GED formula sheet. Uh, just wanted you to know that the GED formula sheet has been revised, adding more uh, formulas in there that wasn't there before. If you wanted to request your own poster size copy, you may. Uh, send your request to help at gbtestingservice.com. And as we go along, uh, we're moving to a new group of content. The second group of content is uh, ratio proportions and percents. For this particular one, if you attend our six-hour math GD training, you will go through an exciting activity in designing a garden. And uh, based on the two six-hour trainings that we've done, uh, that I have done, uh, this is the activity that the teachers enjoyed the most. And um, because it incorporates not only one mathematical skill, but several mathematical skills, and also multiple mathematical practices as outlined in the um, assessment guide of the GED test. Um, this is just to give you, the, uh, uh, you know, a hint of what you know, participants will be doing. They'll be given specifics on how they're going to design the garden. And it becomes competitive. It becomes uh, you know, an activity where students can own up to the problem, uh, and then uh, it's very real to them, and it it really decreases the anxiety from uh, that students have with regards to scale factors. Uh, if you also attend, again, if you attend our uh, six-hour training, there's going to be a ton of calculated skills and tips that we are going to do. Uh, just to give you a, uh, you know, a sampling of that, if you don't know already, you know, we have the fraction button that allows us to enter fractions as they appear on text. And then also the toggle button. So let me spend a little bit of time uh, showing you those two functions and uh, a little bit of a calculator tip. Um, all right. What you have in front of you is a software version of the TI-30XS. If you attend the six-hour training, you will receive a 90-day trial version of this TI-30XS multi-view calculator that you can install on any computer in your class, in your classroom, or at the media center, or at a, uh, in your own personal computer. This, um, having this software available to your students it is a good way to get them familiarized in using the on-screen calculator. Uh, I know that they may allow now the use of the handheld calculators, but it's also good to know how to use this one. Um, so let me show you the use of that um, 
fraction button. So let's say we can enter a fraction, a you know, a simple known fraction just by pressing this button and over D. And then you can press the numbers uh, for the numerator and the denominator of the fraction. So let's just put in a known fraction, let's say three fourths. In order for you to be able to enter the denominator, you're going to have to scroll down using the down arrow button and then you can put in the number for the denominator. And then you can press enter or over just to see it in its final fraction form. So now students, now in this format, students can perform multiple operations with this particular fraction. They can add, multiply, subtract. But one of the, the good things that this will do is that once you, our calculator will allow you to transform this fraction to a decimal just by pressing a button. And that button is your toggle key. And that's this button here at the bottom of the screen, bottom right corner. So what, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press enter just to, make, to, to allow that number that I just entered to go into the calculator's memory. And then if you press the toggle button, you see that it automatically transformed that fraction into a decimal, 0.75. So converting between fractions and decimals and percents is now a thing of the past because now the calculator can do that for them. Um, I found out with my students it does not decrease their mathematical knowledge because I don't want them to get bogged down with simple arithmetic operations on how to convert decimals to fractions and then vice versa. I want them to not get bogged down with those concepts because I want them to start understanding higher level concepts. You know, using and applying the fractions into, let's say, manipulating a equation to solve for an unknown. So then most of the focus of the students is now on the concept and rather than the arithmetic. So that's just a quick preview of the calculator tips, and we're going to go through a lot of tips when you when you go and attempt our six-hour training. I'm going to show them how to use the table, how to use the ask x button, so how to generate multiple values using the table, and also how to solve equations using the table. Also, in the six-hour training, you will be provided with a ton of paper and pencil activities that you can do with your students. Uh, some, an example of that is buying concert tickets. I'm just going to go through and show this very quickly to you. What I have pulled up is... A sample activity of going shopping. What I do with my students, especially when on the computer, I pull up the, uh, you know, a shopping website that goes through the school filter. One of the things that goes through our school filter is the Macy's, uh, Macy's website. When I allow my students to practice, I'm going to. Uh, this is just an application of percents, which is one of the skills that is mostly missed in the GED test. So I allow my students to go shopping, pick three items, and you can, you can see here, it gives them an extra 15% off. So if I scroll down for shoes, girls, we really love doing this activity. Um, then the final sale price at the bottom, I will ask them to take the extra 15% off, put their answers, uh, write their answers down on, on the table that I provided, tally the cost, figure out the sales tax, 
add the shipping and handling costs and then figure out the amount due. Just this activity alone engages students a lot and uh, puts into work a lot of the math concepts that they should already know and that are tested in the 2014 series. That's just a brief review of that. Um, I will not have time to go over a lot of the technology tips, but we, if you attend this six-hour training, you will also be provided with a lot of uh, links uh, to websites that allow students to practice, such as practicing scale drawings, problems in scale drawings and scale factors. And I want to show that to you right now. Very neat website uh, that I came across and we will do is in this particular one, this is an example of a filling the blanks question, uh, engaging students in the problem of scale drawings uh, and scale factors. I will also share during the six hour training a hotspot type of question where students are going to just practice plotting points using the computer. So let's say in this particular problem we wanted to plot zero, negative five, the ordered pair zero, negative five, you know, zero, um, find the zero in the x and then negative five on the y. You know, just give them a little bit of comfort on how to use the computer when graphing because they're so used to graphing on, excuse me, on paper. And they can show the grid values and then you can even check your answer. Some points are correct but not all points are because I haven't plotted the other two. There's another app that is available online that I'm going to share during the six hour training. It is the line plotting. It's not working right now, but there is also a capability to do that. I also talked about um, inequalities and graphing inequalities. Um, this website, IXL, allows you to. If it's small, allows you to graph, uh, it's not showing me very clearly on my screen, so I do apologize for that difficulty, technical difficulty. Uh, if, you, if you're just looking here, it's allowing me to graph an inequality, a response to an inequality. If I click once, it's a closed circle, I click twice, it's an open circle, and I can go left to right. And then I can also check my answer and it gives me immediate feedback. And then again, another practice that you know your students will take great advantage of when they take uh, if they are planning to take the, the GED test. In conclusion, I do not want to go over the other um, content areas uh, that are mostly missed, but Again, in the six-hour training, we will go over these in great detail. We're going to go over a lot of activities that pertains to, you know, to these skills and uh, combine these skills together. You know, because one of the things and the greatest challenges for the math teacher now is now that the content has changed, not only do I have to Not only do I have to continue uh, reinforcing the foundation skills, but also I have to do a little bit of tweaking in the, in the way I teach because the test has changed. 
the format of the TSS page. So um, the rest of this, I'm just going to spend uh, some time for you, if you have any questions to go through. And let me see if I have any questions posted here. Oh, not so much. But um, I have the same message as the GED testing service. Um, use the mathematics language as much as you can. Uh, you know, use the different skills to build a vocabulary. Um, a lot of 